I'm very happy to invite my longtime friend Ville Tulos from California visiting Espo for the moment summer holiday 2018. It's my pleasure to welcome Ville to discuss about the long term developments related to artificial intelligence and machine learning and other things like that. But I remember from uh, when was it? So it must have been 1997 or 98. Yes, 97 yeah. most likely. Or maybe eight. So, but I remember that I got an uh, email uh, from a young scholar for a student who was, you must have been something like 16 years old. 15 or actually. 15, so yes. Yeah. So you uh, posed a question related to neural networks. That's right. So I had uh, defended my PhD thesis on using self-organizing maps mm -hmm. on natural language processing and you had read about it. Yes. So, yeah, it is, it is really an amazing coincidence. And by the way, I mean, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> it's so, so great to see you again. And um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I remember being really, really fascinated about neural networks. And yes. Like uh, all the material I could find at the time was about backpropagation and like building a basic supervised models and using numerical data. And then I just, I, I can't even remember how I came across your PhD thesis about natural language processing. And it was just such a mind blowing experience to learn Thank about you. the Thank possibility. <laughs> Happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And yeah. it was such a surprise to get a uh, kind of a insightful email message from a school uh, kind of right right no and I, I well I mean the, the reason I, I think I contacted you was I mean because of the PhD thesis but also due to the fact that like you were the chairman of the artificial uh, intelligence society of Finland at the time yes and uh, and I thought that okay so I mean like I guess I can't lose much by, by asking that how do you actually represent a natural language like for a neural network Yes. And, I, and I remember you replying, which was um, a, a big success for me. I mean, like a 15-year-old, I mean, I, I felt really proud of myself that I even got the reply, like from, from someone who had defended like his PhD thesis recently. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's how, how it got started. And uh, I, I remember starting to experiment with the ideas. Of course, I mean, with very limited skills at the time. Yes, but, but I mean, one has to start from somewhere. Exactly. And, and it's, it's just nice very motivating. Exactly. Very early on. Mm -hmm. So, but then you continued with your kind of, uh, kind of, you had this interest, keen interest, and you gained programming uh, experience. And right. so you went to high school and uh, then happened what? Right, right. So, so yes, I mean, this was, this was a hobby of mine. And actually, the funny thing is that um, at the time, it seemed that like most people, most, most teenagers who were into, into programming and computers, they were interested in making games. And uh, well, I mean, maybe financially, it would be a better idea to be interested in making <laughs> games. I mean, looking, looking at the history in Finland now. Uh, but like, I, I really wanted to focus on, on, on the question of artificial intelligence. I mean, it just felt so fascinating. Yes. So I, um, so then it, it so happened that I learned that um, the, the Academy of Finland is, it was about to organize the, the, for the first time this competition for young scientists. And I, I, I thought that, well, I mean, like, of course, I have no idea what they are expecting, but I mean, most definitely the, the, the question of artificial intelligence and neural networks sound like science. So, so maybe that's something that I could pursue. So I actually like started thinking like what would be a good topic for the competition. And then uh, you started to work for that uh, role. And then uh, what happened? Uh, did you, right, right. How did you get data for your, because right. you're obviously you were interested in this kind of Nowadays, data-driven is a basic buzzword. Exactly, there. exactly. Well, I mean, you can imagine that, like, kind of a, in, in, in like, a, like before 2000 in northern Finland. I mean, getting, coming across like good data sets wasn't that easy. Yeah, so and you lived in Oulu. Finland. That's right. That's so right. Oulu is some, is it 600 whatever kilometers north from Helsinki? That's right. About 100 miles south from the Arctic Circle. So. Yes. Yeah. So not yeah. many other things to do besides yeah. like hiking. Yes. So, so yes. Yeah, so it happened, and I actually like. I remember like just like uh, asking uh, like a grown ups all, uh, around me that like well I mean like I really need some data like for this experiment and uh, and then so it happened that actually my my mom happened to know a, a, a neurosurgeon like who worked at the university hospital in Oulu and and like um, I, I got the introduction and uh, I explained the kind of the situation that I have is that I, I need some some data set and um, 
and like uh, uh, John Koivumäki, who was the who was the person, the professor there, mm -hmm. uh, he had a lab, and they were like uh, focusing on, on novel techniques for curing and, and like uh, operating uh, brain tumors at the time. Which is a huge coincidence. It is amazing now. <laughs> yes, so now me having had this uh, brain tumor, yeah. so that's a kind of. But it, we can, it, it is. It we is. can discuss that uh, soon more, but. Right. Let's, but let's go through this part of right, the story. Right. So I mean, like, I'm I'm, I'm very thankful for them for uh, for for um, letting me to to kind of uh, uh, like work with them in a sense that like they they had these um, MRI devices, um, magnetic resonance devices, and, and they had been collecting the images from from different kind of lesions and, and tumors. But of course, the data by nature is, is extremely sensitive, so, so you like couldn't share it. you couldn't kind of just take no the data. no. I'm I'm actually like very happy that they just give, didn't give it to a random teenager <laughs> asking. So <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't feel very appropriate. So. Yeah, exactly, and so that's why you need to go there to work. Exactly. So I mean, like the the compromise that we found was that I was able to take my my computer, my personal computer, which was of course a pretty big box at the time, and I actually like kind of got it like to the hospital premises, and I was able to kind of uh, do the hacking there, and I, I remember that I. I, I hacked this uh, like a very simple neural network um, uh, in, in, in C, and uh, and uh, and I was able to access the data, and I was able to create this like a very basic um, uh, like predictor yes. that like it segmented the images and then tried to predict if there's a lesion in the in the image. How uh, about the kind of because one of the questions is that there's data which is kind of naturally uh, numerical right. in a simple way, so n some measurements and so on, which is a kind of easy part for. So if you don't need to kind of start to consider that to how to kind of process it, but then if you have images or text or language or so, so right. then you have to. So how how did you approach this image part when you were kind of high school exactly. student and you needed to kind of find out? So how did you yes, do it? So I always had this idea in the back of my head that the people who do this for real, I mean the real scientists, I mean they they really know how to do it and they might have something that. I, some methods that I have no clue about. So, and, and the simplest thing that I could imagine is that I was able to open the image files, and I was able to able to kind of uh, read um, all the different color channels. Of course, the MR images are black and white, so it was easy enough. So basically, you just had the had the one like uh, luminance channel. Yes. So you basically had like one pixel. value for yes. each pixel. Yes. And I thought that well, I mean, like I'm sure that there are better ways to do this, <laughs> but like the simplest way I could imagine is that I just take the, the basically the brightness yes. value of each pixel, and I use that. So. Yes. And then. Just to make a qu quick comment on the current situation, so these convolutional neural networks are the ones which are now very popular exactly. in regarding image processing, where the idea, if I have understood correctly, it's not my kind of specific area of expertise, but kind of having to know a little bit about all kinds of things. So then the question is that you have to, or you can benefit from the fact that the uh, pixels are kind of next to each other. Right. And that's the kind of what I have understood uh, to be. I, uh, what is, have you been working on, on that particular issue uh, ever after that? Right. Well, um, actually like, yeah, well, I mean, sometime after I, I was like lucky to join the, the computer vision lab in the University of Old where I, I did some some like very basic um, image like processing and like a computer vision actually not with uh, brain tumors but with coffee beans <laughs> <laughs> so, kind of changed the domain there a bit so a little bit less sensitive yes, from I the privacy so, yes. issues yes yes and that's of course a question like now regarding my own situation I would be very happy if or, or everyone would be keen the researchers would be exactly. keen on studying the kind of the That's right. details of the images yes. and, and whatever I'm, could be learned from that. Yeah and I have to say that of course now I mean the, over the past 10 years or so I mean this that particular field has been advancing so fast. What would sure. be your, uh, how would you characterize the ma major parts of the well, developments in I, the I mean like obviously the whole whole field with deep learning I mean, yes. has like changed and I actually remember that this was it's kind of a funny topic that like it didn't come out of the blue exactly. I mean, people had been. I, I remember even like back in the day with like a basic backpropagation. I mean, people said that okay, so you're supposed to have one hidden layer. Yes, and, like and, they, they, and then there were people who were kind of playing with exactly, several layers. Exactly, so it wasn't a new idea. How would you say what is the reason why it became now suddenly a kind of big thing? Whereas I can't say about the history, but they are not. They are at least 20 years old and even more, yeah. I would say. So wh what is the reason why the multi-layer 
kind of system that right. uh, networks on just now is it is it is there some algorithmic new innovation or is there a uh, capacity or what, what is the, right, how right. Would you characterize? I, I think like maybe I mean of course I mean there are people who may know this better but I mean the, the, the kind of having having let's say been in, in Silicon Valley over the past uh, 11 years and, and really the, the shift that I, I saw was much related to well I mean first the, the availability of data yes. and, and just the fact that like Google and other companies started to have massive corpora of images yes. available which yes. I mean I, I remember back in the day I mean there were like a few uh, academic data sets with maybe 10,000 images available and it actually does make a qualitative difference once you have let's say millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of images available yes yes and, and the second one was obviously the computational power yes that was yes. available and, and the combination probably kind of helped and then of course after that I mean people started making algorithmic improvements yes because those who are coming from outside of AI or machine learning area they may think that there are some kind of breakthrough innovations but I think many algorithmic and methodological kind of innovations have been uh, done already 20 or 30 years ago even. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and it's kind of, the, the, the good news is that like the many of the solutions are, are kind of well established. Yes. The, the, the downside I would say is that also the, the problems are the same. Yes, they, so, yes. So, so even though there is a much excitement in the air that okay, so there is the now the new wave of artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, no one ever solved the original problems. So. Yes. So, so still we are still uh, there is a lot to be right. done, and maybe both from the philosophical point of view and mathematical or methodological point of view, there are some things which are kind of impossible. One yeah. can prove that some things are kind of not solvable or something that. But I guess yeah. uh, sometimes when we are dealing with artificial intelligence, there are things which are such that we kind of say that the machines can do things and we humans can. Mm -hmm. But I guess those uh, same principles related to learning also apply to us. So we mm -hmm. are not at all perfect. Absolutely, in, yeah. And that's why we kind yeah. of... Yeah, and, and that is, I mean, actually like it, really um, raises this interesting question like whether this idea of, of general AI in the sense of like trying to imitate humans is actually an interesting goal per se in, yes. in a sense that we are like very limited as, as, as operators in the, in the physical world and, and it's easy to conceive and actually it is already happening that like for instance uh, no human could replace Google for instance so, yes. And, like, yes computers have definitely capabilities beyond us and uh, of course many limitations yes yes but the uh, mm, the context is relevant and these are typically a focused solutions for some purpose right. and this uh, aim at having some general AI uh, so that's that's still kind of yeah. if not fully remaining but there's this question that how to build these kind of cognitive systems yeah. that would have more and I general. I guess the kind of the, the big hope would be that like of course as of today it's still very tedious to build these applications that are very domain specific and you could you, if you could have machines that could learn at the more like meta level I and mean, like learn to learn so mm. to speak and be more generalized in their abilities I mean it would be I mean the hope at least would be that then uh, we could make much bigger advances in a much shorter period of time yes 